Uh, yeah, good day. Uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, or IASC's fourth annual World Commons Week event. And thank you all for attending. Uh, my name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. I'm also the president-elect of IASC, and I'm the co-organizer of this uh, World Commons Week event. Uh, World Commons Week is a global event, an annual event. This, as I said, the fourth time, this is the fourth, where we're celebrating and promoting commons research and practice. And this is the keynote webinar for the uh, IASC North American region. I'd like to welcome and thank Tanya, who's on your screen, who serves as the role as ISC's regional coordinator for North America and who organized this event. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tanya in a minute. I just wanna explain how the webinar will work. Um, we've asked our invited speaker, Javier, to speak for about uh, 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, I'll act as a timer and Tanya will act as a timer and we'll, we'll let him know when, there's, when time's getting short. Uh, the last uh, 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes will be left for Q&A. Um, Tanya will moderate. Um, we do have a hard deadline at the top of the hour. So um, to, to ensure this works well, we've limited video to the speaker and moderator and all attendees are, are muted. But I wanna draw your attention to, I think we're all uh, Zoom experts now, um, there's a Q&A at the bottom of the screen that you can type in at any time your questions, and Tanya and I will, uh, will keep track of them. After the talk is done, we'll turn to them. Um, if it appears we need to unmute you, I'll do that. Uh, and I don't see anybody on phone, so I don't have to describe that. So let me turn it over to Tanya to uh, welcome our speaker. Tanya, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. I'm Tanya Heikala. I'm a professor at the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver, um, and have been studying the commons for a little over 20 years now. And actually, it's about how long I've known uh, Javier Basurto, our, our speaker here. Um, he and I are academic siblings, I guess. <laughs> we share the same <laughs> advisor, the amazing Adela Schlager. Um, and it's just my, you know, great honor to have Javier as our keynote speaker today, um, because he's just doing some really incredible and amazing work on um, fisheries and aquatic foods, and how we engage in cooperation and collective action to improve how we manage these these scarce resources, and. Uh, Professor Basurto is the Truman and Nellie Siemens and Ale Alex Brown and Sons Associate Professor at Duke University. As you can see on his uh, introduct introductory sl slide here, uh, and also the Bass Chair for Excellence in Research and Undergraduate Education. He um, is on sabbatical this semester, so um, extra thanks to Javier for showing up today. Um, he's actually doing field work in Mexico. And um, he has some really exciting new uh, research data, I think, and findings to share with us uh, coming right out of his field work. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Professor Basurto to share his, his talk on local and global lessons on aquatic foods. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to catch up a little bit and, and, and share some of our work with uh, both of you and the rest of the attendees. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> just to put it up front, the, the goal of this presentation is right there. I want to illustrate some key aspects uh, of the governance of aquatic food systems um, through the research I'm, I'm involved. As you might be aware, um, there's been a refocusing into a food systems approach um, in terms of not only understanding what happens in harvesting of fish, but what happens all the way from harvesting to the end consumer and try to understand all of it as a system as opposed to, you know, harvesting on one side, post-harvesting on another side. And that has been happening in terrestrial systems for a long time, but it's quite new into aquatic food systems. So, so th that is why I think it's important to share some key aspects of, of lessons uh, on the governance of, of aquatic food systems. 
as this gains momentum around the world. And, and I focus my work on the governance of small scale fisheries because not only they're very diverse around the world, as you can see in the picture, but they employ most of the fishers around the world. And in some places, uh, in some coastal areas and inland actually too, they're the main human activity. And so we, we want to understand the governance of aquatic foods. We need to understand what happens um, in the context of small scale fisheries as opposed to large scale, which are large boats, much more mechanized. Here we're talking about activities that are really deeply embedded in, in the livelihoods of people in small communities around the world. And so I'll share some, some work I'm currently doing. I'm currently in Chiapas, Mexico. It's one of the Southern states um, in Chiapas. You know, there's more than 28 languages that are spoken. It's a heavily indigenous population, mostly of Mayan, Mayan origin. And I'm currently here conducting field work. In, and last week, I'll share some, some of that work. Now, last week I was in the coast, which, this is a picture of, and I couldn't resist putting also the marine environment because differently from other areas, you have a very large continental shelf, as you can see, and then it drops significantly. And whenever you have a very large continental shelf, you have a lot of fish. And if in, in the community we're working in, it's on that red dot, which is in the context and embedded into a very large coastal lagoon, which you might be able to see there. And so coming further in, if you were in the water, you will see that it's, you know, you will see that mountain range on the left, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the mountains are here in the deep, deep green. So it's, a, you know, inundation plain, then the coastal lagoon, and then a huge continental shelf. And on the right, you can see the boat, uh, long canoes with more small motors. And two of my colleagues, Amy Hudson Weaver and Viviana Ruiz, who we went to this place, as I mentioned a, a week ago, to visit this fishing community. What they mostly fish there are shrimp. Uh, shrimp is very abundant, as you will imagine, in a coastal lagoon. And they fish it using what they call changos. A chango is a fixed net. On the picture on the left, you see five changos kind of just resting. They're not fishing. Whenever they're ready to fish, they will extend this net. And the fisher on the right is illustrating how he will go about extending the net. And it's a, it's a system of funnels that captures the shrimp um, as the current flows in a particular direction. And so, Fishers have known positions where they do this. And so this particular fisher has five tangles, five nets that he uses um, at this particular time of the year. And they fish this shrimp that you can see on, on the top. Now the shrimp, <clears throat> which is the main target, uh, also comes mixed with those small tardines that in the picture, which also have a market. And um, they are eaten everywhere in Mexico. And there's two ways of fishing the sardines, uh, charales, which are the name in Spanish. With this cast net, as this um, person is about to do, um, and this is, this is legal and, and it's the most environmentally friendly way to do it because um, it only targets those sardines, small sardines. But now, but it's, it's labor intensive. It's a lot of work. You need help. And it just takes, you know, a lot of work. The most common now way of fishing these small sardines is through these thin nets that are made of mosquito nets. And so it's a very, very fine mesh um, that takes out everything, not only the sardines, but the larvae of whatever is in the estuary. Larvae of fish, larvae of small fish, large fish, larvae of mussel, mus uh, mollusks, larvae of crustaceans, it's a very environmentally destructive um, way of fishing, but it's less la labor intensive, it's very efficient, and it's very common around the world. You might have seen articles coming out of Africa about the use of mosquito nets. Um, 
the charales, the sardines are are dried as they're doing in this in this mud flat, and that's what is going to go out to the market once they're dried and 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 cleaned. Now, um, as we have learned, you know they go to the bigger towns of Arriaga and Panala, and from there they go south to Guatemala sometimes, and to go to other places, um, even to the most remote places you can imagine. In last year, I was lucky enough to to be able to spend a week in the mountains of Oaxaca, uh, visiting these communities that are very isolated. Um, you can see in the picture one community here to the left and another one that if you can follow my cursor uh, on the right, these are ancient communities. Um, some of them have some of them have been there uh, for more than a thousand years. Uh, if you were in Italy, you will see a castle there. But these are <clears throat> these are indigenous communities that have been there for a long time, and they depend on a variety of foods um, that are mostly terrestrial. But to my surprise, when we were there um, eating with the community, this is what we were served. Um, a little bit of radish, local vegetables, and fish, small fish, the charales that I just sh showed you, and pumpkin seeds. In fact, throughout our time there, uh, let me show you what we, we ate. You know, a variety of, of vegetable stews. Um, here on the right, you have an egg, um, tamale, if you will. It's it's a mix of egg and corn wrapped in a in a delicious leaf of um, a plant I can't remember the name. Tortillas, beautiful salsas, some some apples, some you know fruits, cheese, tamales. But the main protein we ate, I think we ate chicken ones. The main protein we ate was those small fish um, charales, and they come from that you know, those coastal communities and they're fished in the way that I showed you before. Now, there has been a flurry of work on the nutrient importance of fish uh, in the last five years, I would say. Um, I just put two of the, of the papers um, I know about, but there's been particularly attention around the world to the importance of micronutrients and the contribution that fish in particular, as opposed to chicken and other types of, of food uh, groups provide. Fish provides um, the most micronutrients that are particularly important for the development of infants in their first thousand days of, of age. If you don't get those micronutrients at that particular time, um, you might start or the infant start to suffer of stunting meaning its cognitional development starts to be delayed. And so this is a project, that, this is data coming out of a global project I'll mention later that I'm involved in. And it shows the different um, functional taxonomic groups of marine species um, and inland species harvested around the world through small scale fishing. So this is a global project on small scale fishing. And one aspect of it is trying to understand what is fished and you have all those fishing groups there and what is their nutritional importance in terms of this micronutrients, particularly sticks that are mentioned above. So in the graph, you see the recommended daily intake in terms of percentage of six uh, nutrients from a hundred gram portion of uh, serving. And the micronutrients are selenium, omega, three zinc, calcium, iron, vitamin A. And again, on the y-axis, you have all the different um, functional taxonomic groups that are fished. And you can see that, you know, the one that provides, or the lesson coming out of this work is that small pelagic fish from inland and marine waters are the most nutritious, particularly here, um, herring, sardines, and anchovies, those small fish that I showed you before. Um, okay, so they're they're very important, um, you know, nutritionally, not only you know around the world, but we know that whether those valuable nutrients stay locally um, depends on a number of factors, right? So, so let me mention a few. Uh, one is traditions of local exchange. 
What I mean by that, this woman here in the picture, um, and this happens throughout the world and Mexico certainly, um, she, she was not a fisher, she might be a relative of the fishers or somebody from the community. An exchange of helping clean the fish, in this particular case, separating the sardines from the, the shrimp, she gets some shrimp or some sardines um, as a gift in return. And she might take that to eat or, or um, sell it, but it's mostly, mostly to, to eat. This other woman, um, uh, she's also helping to clean. You can see in her hand, she has two sardines that she's cleaning, but he also had just bought uh, breakfast from a local vendor that was just selling, um, I believe, some you know tortillas with tomato. And, and so she might sell whatever she's given to buy other foods. And Coca-Cola is certainly a local staple. So the fact that they have access to this very nutritious fish doesn't mean they're eating it. It depends what the local habits there are. Um, and of course, it depends how the fishery is self-governed. And I use self-governed um, yeah, explicitly or, or purposely because, because these communities, um, the influence and the presence of the government's external, external authorities is, is almost null. So however the fishery is governed depends on how the fishers organize themselves. They're organized to reach the first point of commercialization, et cetera. In Mexico, in this, in this particular place, there's two types that are very common in Mexico and as it turns out around the world. One is a local buyer that you can see there. Um, in fact, the guy with the, uh, the basket, the plastic basket is helping weight the shrimp. And on the left, you see the buyer and the bag, it has a bag of coins and on his left hand, he has a bag where he has the bills and he's talking with this woman and he's gonna pay him in cash. This is, this is a setting where the fishers are not organized in an association. They're individually organized and they work for this fish buyer. And there's many kinds of fish buyers. This woman in red also was buying, was buying shrimp, uh, although at a much smaller scale. And you can see, you can see in her hands, she has a rolled bills um, that she's going to use to pay for whatever amount of shrimp she's, um, she's wanting to to buy and she's gonna go just to the next community to sell to sell the the fish and make some money but the other fish buyer is gonna go much farther and it's a much bigger operation now in the same community we were there to work with two fishing cooperatives and the project we have is a very much it's a very applied project where um we are working to understand what collective action problems they face and what they want to do about it and, and how we can help them engage and overcome some barriers for collective action. But this helps me illustrate two key forms of self-governance that I've um, described in, in previous publications, which is on the one hand, you have fishing organizations, what I call collective self-governance. Another one, you have this pattern client arrangements where fishers um, contract. It's all informal. You see it's all cash. Contract individually with a fish buyer, what I call non-cooperative self-governance. And so these two forms of self-governing you know, fishing have different types of outcomes uh, in a number of dimensions. Um, so... Before you know, I come back to that, um, I think it's important to, to step back a little bit and reflect on what aspects of food systems have received most attention. I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that, that there's been a lot of attention to harvesting. You know, when we think of common pool resources, we, we, a lot of the issues we had studied, for instance, have been about how they solve collective action problems regarding harvesting. But now that there's this reframing towards food systems, um, folks are doing like um, this particular study that I'm familiar with by Javier Teso and colleagues. They looked, they did a literature review um, on food systems, on fisheries and aquaculture for Asia. And what they did is they looked 
and they define a food system as you see in the screen. You know, on the one hand is the the harvesting side, the production as they call it. You know, and here because they're looking at farmed and wild, um, there's interaction among them, particularly in, a in Asia where you have a lot of family aquaculture operations. Fishing and, and aquaculture is very much interweaved. And then you have this provision aspect, and then the consumption, which is, you know, um, has also received a lot of attention. So I'm going to not pay attention to the farm side, just to show you um, here is how what they call production, provision, and consumption. And, and below, you have the total number of papers they looked at. Um, and so 100% of the 35 articles they reviewed talk about production. Only 11% of the articles talk about provision and 37 talk about consumption. This is again, just to illustrate that provision has received the least attention. And I argue that um, the work we do with self-governance is related to provision because in order to unpack provisioning, you need to understand how fishers are govern themselves. And I have illustrated two extreme forms. There's a lot of gray areas between a patron client and cooperatives um, in the field, but in terms of analysis, putting them as two separate, very clear forms of self-governance is usual. To, is, is very useful for us to start doing some uh, modeling work as we've done um, in the, the figure below uh, in colors is part of a paper where we modeled, um, did an agent-based modeling looking at half our population engaged in cooperatives and half in patron client relationships. And, and we've done studies like that to understand um, different outcomes of interest. You know, the capacity, uh, adaptive capacity of these two different forms of governance, the resilience to environmental and economic shocks. Um, right now we're doing a study with COVID, how COVID affected these different forms of self-organization and, and other outcomes that are uh, of interest. Now, um, that's Javier. Thank you. In 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 other parts of Mexico, we've done um, we've done much more work, and uh, particularly in Baja California, where we have been able to bring into studies by physical information. So let me show you some ongoing work of two different areas of Baja California that tend to be the most important in terms of the amount of, of harvesting fish that comes out. So this is work led by Tim Frawley and an uh, NSF grant that we have. And what he shows here in the picture on the left, you can ignore the, the text. Um, here, the main question, well, the text says, you know, the main question is how do different forms of self-government differ in their fishing strategies? How or what are research diversification patterns we see um, when we take into account the regional biophysical context. So we have two of other forms of self-organization we're studying um, on top. You can see large cooperatives, because in Mexico you have also small cooperatives and we define them differently, of course, and large scale operations of patron clients in the two different regions. And this, the name of the species are in Spanish um, right now, but the networks show the different portfolios of species, the different, you know, the large scale cooperative is targeting in the Vizcaino region. And in that same region, uh, other fishers organized through a fish buyer, uh, a patron client operation, target, as you can see, diff very different portfolio species. Well, the cooperatives um, are targeting langost, lobster, and abulone for the most part. The size of the circle gives you a sense indicates the amount of, of that species that is harvested. And the gray area linking the other circle indicates the number of fishers that are engaged in that activity. So in the Vizcaino region, we see you know, large numbers of members of fishing cooperatives harvesting lobster and abalone. They harvest much more lobster than abalone and a little bit of sea cucumber. But in that same region, um, the big circle sorry, the name is not there, is uh, fin fish. And so most of the, oops, most of the harvest is on fin fish. And some of it in a much lesser amount is on shark, tiburon. 
but it's a much more diversified portfolio of species. Now, the same large cooperatives in a very different region harvest a different portfolio of species, Wachinango is snapper. So a lot of most of the catches on snapper and other fin fish species. But again, that a different forms of self-governance is harvesting also snapper, the same snapper, but it's making linkages uh, to other types uh, like sharks. So, so here we're starting to, to understand how different forms of self-governance uh, interact with environment um, in different ways in, in different regions. Now, you know, let me make a break again, um, and I'm going to switch to to talk about this global project and and what patterns we see at the global level. Um, and I link it by pointing to something that fishers told us while we were in the coast last week. You know, when we engage them in the conversation, okay, you know, what you can do for yourself, okay, and they they will, you know, in terms of sol sol solving collective action problems, and what do you need help from the government? they always say we need help with monitoring and enforcement. Um, in this case, you know, there's this very destructive way of fishing that everybody knows is, is illegal. It's not the best way of doing it, it's destroying the environment, but it's so efficient um, that it's very hard for fishers to resist the temptation of engaging in this way of fishing. And so we see this, this um, request as a way that they can, they can have a productive interaction with the, with the outside authorities through monitoring and enforcement. The problem, and this is a, a problem around the world, is that the capacity of government to monitor and enforce in these very small communities um, is almost none because the very limited capacity from the state to do monitoring and enforcement goes to large scale fisheries. So national bureaucracies um, engage in large scale fisheries monitoring and enforcement for a variety of reasons. They use their national budget for fisheries um, to pay attention to large scale fisheries like this big sh shrimp boat we have there. Um, and Part of the issue is that when a minister of finance asks, so how much of my budget should I devote to small scale fishery? There's no answer because we don't have data because there's almost no data collected about small scale fisheries around the world. We don't know how many fishers they're engaged in, how much they produce, uh, what is the nutritional value of the species? And so to change that narrative, to have a better answer, well, most of the fishers that are, that are employed in fisheries are small scale fisheries, for instance. We developed this project in collaboration with FAO and colleagues at World Fish, which had a network of research centers. So for the last four years, we have developed uh, what we call this Illuminating Human Harvest Research Initiative, where with it, we engage with the researchers in 58 countries and have collected data on more than 2,000 small scale fisheries which we now know has covered um, global coverage of 69% of the marine catch, 63% of the inland catch, to, to gain an understanding. And, and you can find more information about this project in the website below. I'm just going to touch in a couple of very small findings from this global project. Um, but the idea was, and the reason it's very large is we wanted to collect data on environmental variables, social variables, governance, and economic to be able to measure and say something about the environmental contributions that small scale fisheries make to particular um, sustainable development goals. So what are the contributions that small scale fisheries make to nutrition? And that's linked to the SDG2 zero hunger. And so there's linkages to the the environmental contributions in terms of catch, the economic contributions in terms of employment, um, value of the catch, et cetera. And yeah, and so just very, very rapidly and, and superficially, these are the 58 countries for which we collected data. This was secondary data. We engaged with the experts and insiders in these countries that had knowledge about data already produced about the variables of interest, employment, uh, catch, um, 
devolution of rights uh, for governance and nutrition, gender, how many women are involved. And this is the coverage of our study um, after four years. More or less how we did the study, we engaged with experts on the ground. And we also, as a way to triangulate through FAO, we developed an effort questionnaire to all the member countries in, in, in the UN system, 104 responded, where we asked some of the same questions um, of the data that was collected by in-country teams as a way to triangulate and verify. And we also did research on already available data sets that were relevant for a study or, or longitudinal um, surveys that are done at the national level, um, labor surveys, and there's a number of surveys that are done systematically that were relevant for us. And we also commissioned some thematic studies on key topics that cannot tell you the story of the contributions that small scale fisheries make to sustainable development, because you cannot do that through a database, but they are important. And the importance of identity, the importance of indigenous knowledge, et cetera. So that's all being wrapped up in a global report that will be out next year. What you see here is, is just the process of research. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through, through it in detail, um, but because I've already said a lot, we are right now um, in the process of writing peer review publications um, and publishing the report next, next year. This is um, an infographic with the main findings that came out last year. Again, um, for the first time, knowing how much fish is coming out of small scale fisheries, how much is, is from marine fish or inland catch, how many people are involved in direct employment through subsistence fishing, what is the nutritional value of that catch, uh, providing essential nutrition, some of the lessons we've learned through governance and the role of women. You know, four out of 10 people in SF are, are women. Now, um, yeah, I'm gonna, this was a very collaborative process within country teams because there was no way to understand and to, to really assure the quality of the data if we didn't engage in a back and forth between the teams of um, students that were screening the data, the in-country teams and the technical team analyzing, analyzing the data. Now, just to share a couple of, of findings, uh, one of the main challenges we faced is small scale fisheries is very diverse. And so there's no definition, in fact. It's a very contentious issue, how you define small scale fisheries. Uh, some countries have a formal definition embedded in law, and some countries don't. And there's been global conversations to can we have a global definition and usually ends um, in let's do it later type of outcome. Uh, and so one of the things that we were able to do to this study through a survey, which we call characterization matrix, we were able to start identifying different archetypes of small scale fissures. We use variables um, like you see in the screen, some are technological and some are social, like ownership, different types of ownership. I just show you two in, in the work we do in Mexico but also different types of gears, motorization, how far they go from the shore. And this way we were able to start to make sense of the huge institutional diversity of small scale fissures you see. Um, you know, this matrix has 13 ordinal variables. Uh, we did a cluster analysis that has started to allow us to identify this 10 marine typologies or archetypes that I'm, I say um, in almost, thousand uh, fishing units or small scale fisheries. And so these are, uh, this is a visual representation of the different archetypes, types of small scale fisheries. And this is work done with Nicolas Gutierrez and Alban Guion, who's a postdoc in our group. And this is visually how it looks, you know, from the small scale fisheries here on the left that are so artisanal that a boat is not needed. It's very informal. Most of it, it goes to household consumption to the groups um, that are, you know, almost looking large scale, very large boats. Um, they're harvesting mostly tuna for very, um, for global markets, but they're defined as small scale fishers in their own countries and, and a huge variation in between. 
Why this is important? Because now that we are able to identify different types of small scale fisheries, it's, it's, able, it's, it's easier to start making progress on how they're governed um, and, and develop policies that are specialized for different types of small scale fisheries. Five minutes, Javier. Uh, thank you. I'm going to skip that. And just to, we are also doing um, global analysis similar to what we did in Mexico for the Mexico data set that I just showed you. You can focus on the pie charts on the left. This shows the global data, the global catch of small scale fisheries disaggregated by different types of self governance, if you will. Um, one of the categories is owner and operator. The owner of the boat also operates the boat. It's the most artisanal. Um, and the one below, I'm just going to focus on those two owner who hires crew. This is this can be seen as the pattern client relationship. It might be, you know, the pattern or the fish buyer sometimes buys buys boats, buys gear, and and rents it or hires crew to fish for him. And you can see the different colors are the different species that are being harvested. So just like we saw different portfolios of species in different regions in Mexico, we're seeing the same pattern um, in, in a global data set where you know, owner operator harvest much more in, in vertebrates uh, than the owner who hires crew. This is the pink and the color, for instance. And, and so now we're starting to understand, okay, why that might be the case, what markets they might be targeting. Um, are they going for volume or they're going for small quantities because you know they have better price? You can start answering all those questions. Finally, just to give you a flavor where governance comes in, we have a data set of more than 800 governance arrangements um, around the world. And we looked at what rights are associated with this governance arrangement. And we need to do it very broadly because the data is, you know, it's, it's a global data set. So from, from governance arrangements that have devolved these different types of, of rights, property rights or tenure rights, using Adela Schlager's and Lynn Ostrom's um, property rights classification, you know, and the right, no rights are, none of these rights are devolved, um, all the way to devolving, devolving full rights. Um, and so, on the right, you see how that distributes to different variables or different rules that we see are associated uh, with this governance arrangement. For instance, are the rules formal or informal? Are the rules, um, are they devising local rules uh, of management? Is the governance arrangement all, only pertaining to small scale fisheries? Is the governance arrangement saying something about giving exclusive access to small scale fisheries? First, are territorial user rights of fisheries? Do they have rules specifically linked to, to the space that are, they're, they're working at? And do they have rules uh, determining total, total allowable catch, how much catch they can, they can get? And so the general pattern we see is those governance arrangements the, 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 where there's no devolution, the, re, the red squares, um, are more to the left than the, the dotted line, which is the average in our global data set. And the more the rights are devolved, we see the more these rules that are associated with more local governance. And um, in a way, more uh, rules that are able to fit the local ecological context um, in which the fishery takes place like what these fishers are hoping for, right? They, they're they hoping they can, you know, if they had developed rights of management, they will be able to be involved in decisions about monitoring and enforcing. Enforcement, they might be able to be involved in banning gear uh, gears like this mosquito net, et cetera. So just um, the next steps um, after this, we're, we're working with a couple of countries to incorporate the methodology um, so we can move from so we can move from a general approach of just collecting government data on fisheries related to catch and value uh, and expand that data collection um, to collecting data about nutrition, collecting data about how many women are involved, how many fishers are employed. 
so that we can start to better answer um, why should we devote, you know, devote more of our national budget to fisheries? Um, and, and there can be researchers and practitioners trained in a broader methodology um, that can answer those questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Javier. That was an excellent presentation. I'm giving a round of applause. I, the people who are <laughs> listening can't um, clap, but um, let's see. Can We're you... used to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, we already have some excellent questions coming in the chat. So I'm going to just share them with you and um, hear your responses. I, of course, have questions, but I'm not going to hog the conversation. Uh, <laughs> I can always follow up later. So yeah. our first question is from Tom Kuntz. And Tom says, very interesting research. I am wondering if the cooperatives do a better job than the patron-client structure at reducing harmful fishing techniques like mosquito netting. Uh, I think from theory, I predict the patron-client structure doesn't reduce harmful fishing techniques. So what is your mm -hmm. response to Tom? Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thanks for, for listening too. Um, yeah, no, you're right. We don't see, we don't see differences uh, in terms of form of self-governance necessarily linked to, to gear, except when fishing organizations have rights to a territory. And that's more likely to happen when fishers are organized um, through cooperatives, right? Um, so in Mexico and, and Chile and other places, um, fishing concessions are given to fishers if you're organized into an association. And a fishing concession gives you a territory and then that provides incentives for fishers to start paying much more attention to, to the gear they use. However, we have also, and, and I guess I'm going to contradict a little bit myself, um, we've seen this also happening in patron-client relationships that are working on, on very localized territories like or if the market is asking for a particular qual quality um in mexico red snapper you know they the red snapper is sold whole and people like to see it as a whole fish in their plate and the fish needs to look pretty so first was fish with nets and when the fish buyer said no i need better quality or better looking fish it's all gonna be hook and line an entire region changed to fish only who can line. So, so I guess it's possible. Um, it depends on, on a number of factors. Yeah. Right. Um, Tom, hopefully that answered your question. As Charlie said in the chat, if any, anybody wants to come off mute to uh, follow up, please just raise your hand um, or type in the, the Q&A and we'll, we'll, we'll let you chat. So I'll, I'll move on to the next question um, from Evaristo. And this says, how do the different governance systems in your study area engage women within the fish value chain? I think you touched on that a little bit, but maybe you could give some more specifics. Um, what proportion of the benefits are accruing to women? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to put this up again. So, so, from the global study, we know that most, so you can see from our infographic that four out of 10 people in, in small scale fisheries are women. And below, you know, you can see the, where they come in in the value chain. Uh, and most participation comes in the post harvesting, meaning they are involved in separating the fish, as I showed in the south of Mexico, separating, you know, the shrimp from the sardines. Uh, in processing, doing some kind of processing before it's sent to the market. You know, in, in Asia, you know, they they clean or separate the shrimp by sizes, or the swimming crabs are, you know, tied up in a particular way. Most of that work has been done by women. The other way they come in is through subsistence fishing. We now know through this study that almost half of the fishers out there are engaged in subsistence fishing, meaning fishing for self-consumption. And almost all of them, um, almost half of them, 45% are women. Now, 
our numbers probably underestimate women's participation because we depended on working on secondary sources of data. And we know most of the work out there, it's a little bit skewed towards fisheries where people have a boat. Um, and the most unreported, undocumented type of fishing is the fishing where fishers are walking fishers. They're collecting with their hands, they're walking on estuaries. And most of that work is done by, by women. And, and again, most of it is going to self-consumption. So it, it's not in part of the value chain, but it plays an important role in terms of the nutrition aspect. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to the, the third question we have from Min Wu, and then I think I have one uh, coming in from, from Charlie. So uh, from Min Wu, um, the question is, well, first, Min Wu says, thank you for the presentation. It was very inspiring, <laughs> and it was a fantastic overview um, of small-scale fisheries in Mexico and around the world. So the question is, when you do field work and interviews, what are the major fears or threat factors from local indigenous people um, about the future? So is it about the economy, survival, preservation of culture, identity, multi-generational issues? How are people thinking about the future right now? Oh boy. Um, thank you, Minwu. That's that's a, a great question and it's a, you know, that's a large question. Um, yeah, I think what we see in Mexico, which is where I do most of my field work, is, um, and what I tell my students when they come in is, why should you assume fishers should trust you? In other words, that um, there's a lot of reasons why local populations, local fishers, indigenous in particular, have to mistrust the presence of outsiders, people coming out to ask them questions. Um, you know, in the past, those interactions have not been very positive for the indigenous groups. Um, you know, either they have resulted in the banning of some species uh, being fished. So there's a lot of, of mistrust. And so that limits your ability to ask questions and to gain an understanding, particularly related to the governance, uh, how decisions are made, which is what we are interested on. So on the one hand, you know, that answers your question is, you know, what is the, the major fear and threat? Um, they have a fear of outsiders coming to change their lifestyle. Uh, and the other, they are worried about their future. They can see that the amount of fish is diminishing. They it's not that they don't know, they absolutely know. Um, the example of this mosquito net, everybody in the community, everybody that is fishing using this mosquito net knows how harmful it is. And so they know that that might reduce the amount of fish they have tomorrow, but they don't see many other choices. And it's the classic tragedy of the commons, right? They know if they don't do it, somebody else will. And so, so they're trapped in this social dilemma um, of either if, you know, what options they I have. Um, some options that are that are available for them are to do agriculture. And some people do agriculture different times of the year or engage in other economic activities if they're if they are available. But in some these economic activities are might be only available during parts of the year or not available at all. Um, as the fishing traditions change, um, their culture will change, or the identity will change. So all, this, all these issues are, are you know, linked, um, the availability of fish with their culture and their, their identity. And those issues prevent them from, might prevent them or make it harder for them to, to move to different economic activities as well. Because I'm a fisher, I'm not a farmer. Um, these stories have been well documented in Newfoundland, for instance, when the cod collapsed in Newfoundland and aquaculture and the state promoted aquaculture, many fishers never didn't want to become, you know, to move into aquaculture. They're like, no, I'm not a farmer. I like to go out and, and fish. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of the multi-generational issue, I'll just say that we see young people coming into fisheries, particularly when they're high value. And fisheries that are not very high value, we don't see a lot of young people coming in. And so in some parts of the world, um, you're, you're, folks are documenting the, the aging of the fleet. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Yeah, Anya, go ahead and take the question that's in Q&A. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Yeah, really important question there, um, Javier. And I think you've, you've been, you've, you've touched on a lot of reasons why we should care about small scale fisheries and, and their role in this broader kind of global system of, of food production. And um, I think you've given us a lot of really excellent uh, reasons why we need to spend more time not just studying the, the, the production side of this, but the provision, the consumption, the, the, the benefits to community and, and how this um, is just really important for, for so many people globally. So um, another question that just came in from um, Sojung is um, that says, thank you for your interesting research. Um, you've already mentioned the value of women's contributions. Um, Sojung conduct, conducted a survey and interview for her research on the co-management uh, fishery system in South Korea. Uh, she observed that the higher levels of collective action for sustainable resources are presented when a community has the higher, higher female proportions. I'm wondering whether you have any kinds of similar observations during your research. I don't. Um, sounds fascinating. Um, I don't. I haven't. Partly because I mostly do my field work in Mexico and the involvement of women in the harvesting side is, is very minimal. Um, but I can see reasons why you will see that. Um, I think women, given that they are usually thinking about feeding their children as well, have different discount rates um, in their fishing activity or, or, and so different than men. In other ways, they value the future of the fishery differently than men. And so, so I, could, I could see why they are making decisions differently. They're thinking about the present and future value of their, of, of their activity in a different way and maybe more willing to make investments um, and develop rules and, and internalize the transaction costs um, of developing and monitoring those rules as opposed to, to other contexts where fishers might say, no, it's not worth my time. I, I will fish now and we'll figure out later. Yeah. Great, it sounds like an area where you might need more research. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's great. Charlie, you had a very quick follow up question. Do we have time for it? Uh, I think with the time, we have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So, I think I just want to see if any of the attendees want to be unmuted to make any, uh, any response at all. Uh, I just want to offer that in case anybody's mm -hmm. sitting there saying, I really wish I could talk to Javier. Um, I, I did have one kind of big high level question for Javier. And um, I guess one thing that struck me when, when you're collecting all of these really important data on, on hidden harvests and these small scale mm -hmm. fisheries, is there any risk that when that, the evidence of the importance of these small scale fishers becomes more real and tangible to governments that they're going to step in and muck with the self-governance systems? And, and is there some risk to that? So as a researcher, are no. you putting, putting these communities at risk in any way? Yeah, no, no, you hit it. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've, we've had a lot of conversations about this and we decided that, that the costs of not being part of national policies are larger than the government stepping in. Also, the fishers want the attention. The fishers want to feel that they, I'll give you an example. A lot of fishers do not have fishing permits because the government is too far away. And they go to extremes to get to be legal, even when there's no monitoring and enforcement, when nobody's gonna tell you, oh, you're fishing illegally. Just knowing that you are legal, which means you're part of something bigger, it's important for them. So. So the fishers also want to be paid attention. Um, yeah. Right. And, and it will happen. It, there yeah. will be the typical problem of, of government uh, external authorities coming in. 
Yeah. yeah, I'll stop there. I had to sneak that one in. All right, Charlie, yeah. I'm passing it Charlie. on to you. <laughs> Tanya, that's amazing. We did not talk about that, but that was um, a, a nice transition to what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, Tanya, as you know, we've been talking about what we think might be an important conference for IASC in the future that's around either a public policy in commoning or um, I'm starting to use the state supported self governance um, mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that clearly was touched on a lot here in this uh -huh. talk. And uh -huh. I'm seeing nods and smiling at least. Um, I think I think we really should try to have ISC do a, a, a thematic conference around that topic. Um, the other yeah. thing I wanted to raise was um, uh, I'm about to turn to close, um, but uh, Tobias Holler, who's one of the co uh, leaders of the IASC Nairobi conference, um, if you go to that website, and I'll put that website up in a second, uh, the number one theme in that website is about the sustainable development goals. And um, what he's been telling me is that the ideas around commons, commoning, self governance is not in any of those. Um, mm -hmm. it's not discussed and he's trying to get that to change. Um, I, I don't know those, the, the text and all those goals, but that's what I'm hearing from him. Um, mm -hmm. with that, I'm going to just share screen or I don't know if you want to say anything in response to that, Javier, but, um, no, 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 no. I, I, I agree. And, um, yeah, I think we have a lot to say, um, in the challenges of linking to the sustainable development goals through yeah. this work we've done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me just um, close first by, um, I think by you could you raise your hand at least. Um, there's no real easy way to, to clap for Javier for his talk, but what a wonderful, um, and uh, I'm just blown away by the deep methods, the deep analysis. Uh, there was a lot in that talk. Um, uh, and I want to thank Tanya for organizing it, and I want to thank the attendees for making time out of their day to be here. Um, just as we're closing, uh, I wanted to point you, you know, happy World Commons Week. Um, and uh, we have a video contest going on right now on the website where you can look at the three finalists and, and vote. Um, I just want to show you quickly what we've done so far and where we're going for the rest of the week. So uh, we had the African uh, keynote um, yesterday. If you missed it, it's on the website uh, in the YouTube. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, uh, second one, uh, the Oceana one happened yesterday. And uh, Matakari's, uh, Matariki's talk was, uh, uh, both of them were just fantastic. Uh, I really, really encourage you to go look at those. Um, coming up, so in about nine hours from now, I'm coming out of Singapore. Uh, Eduardo will be giving his talk on the state of research and collective action in the commons. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting exactly the time compared to now, but um, in China, we've got Yahua, who's um, giving a talk about his introduction to the Commons Governance textbook. Um, that's going to be in, in Chinese with live English. I don't know exactly what time that is, but go to the website if you're curious. Tomorrow, we're going to have the Latin American one, um, and you can see the speakers here. Um, that'll be in Spanish. Uh, on the 9th, we've got Giuseppe, uh, who's, uh, you can read his talk title. Uh, again, all of these are, are on the website, the World Commons Week website, with a time and date calendar translator, so you can find out when it would be for your time. And we're closing the week on the 10th, which uh, with uh, two of our wonderful early career um, network scholars um, talking about growing together as an intellectual community. So that's how we're going to wrap up with our, our fantastic um, young, younger colleagues. Um, I encourage you to go to the IASC Commons um, uh, Nairobi website. Uh, call for abstracts are only 250 words, but they're due on December 12th. So I hope I have a chance to meet attendees there in person. Uh, I want to thank my two other co-organizers who've been helping me with this. And uh, just uh, thanks so much. Uh, spread the word about World Commons Week. Join ISC if you're not a member and, and join the community. And Javier, again, thank you so much for your, your time and effort. Thank so you. That, thank you for the invite. Yeah. yeah.
to you, everyone. We'll thanks, everyone. We'll close the session now. Thanks for being here. And Bye. thanks again, Tanya. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you, Charlie. My pleasure. <laughs> Um, I'm still here. Um, yeah, yeah, let thank me just you so stop much. recording. Hold on. Yeah.